got to just all the hours, you know, pay the idea of like paying your dues. That's basically what faking it till you make it is. It's, it's that's you paying your dues. You know, you, you say yes to everything and figure it out on the way and, and, and just, just work really hard if you want to be good. Welcome to Works in Process, a series of conversations where I talk to creative individuals about their latest projects. I'm George Garastegui. And that's this episode's guest, Eli Nugaborn. He's an illustrator and educator who lives and teaches in Brooklyn, New York. I catch up with him today to talk about his journey as an illustrator his five plus year project called Join the News, and some of the side hustles he'd had along the way. Let's get into our conversation and hear his process. Once again, thank you, Eli, for joining us on the Works and Process podcast. And I start each podcast with something kind of silly. This is just a series of questions that get us loose. So I'm going to ask you a series of this or that questions and then after some word associations. Okay. So is it cool? That's cool. Um, so let's go. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Toast or a bagel? Bagel. Rock or hip hop? Both. If you had to pick one. If I had to pick one, oh man. I guess rock. Beatles or Rolling Stones? Stones. Biggie or Tupac? Biggie. You got to say that. You're in Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, but I'd say I said it when I was in California, too. So. <laughs> Beer or wine? Beer. Cool. Um, and now the word association. So just kind of the first thing you think of when I say these words. Okay. Creativity. Art. Design. <sighs> Modern. Art. Me. <laughs> Business. Money. Failure. Up. Clients. Hell. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Mistakes. Are made. Tools. For use. Skills. To pay the bills. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Opportunity. Knox. Future. Bright. Risk. Averse. And process. Continuity. Nice. Thanks. <laughs> A couple of those are pretty uh, pretty cliche, but no. my responses, I mean. I think the business one is the most cliche. Yeah, yeah. Money, but... Um, so yeah, um, those are just kind of like fun things. Now that we're starting the interview, many of our listeners may not know who you are at the moment. So I kind of wanted to give them a short origin story. I wanted you to give them a short origin story, kind of, you know, your school, your jobs up until, um, now and kind of what that quick rise in the ranks, what got you to where we are today. Sure. Yeah, for me, the the it definitely has not been a quick rise. It's been a, a slow and steady, you know, just kind of every day, every day out there hustling, working hard thing. Um, comics were always my thing when I was a kid, uh, and just drawing in general. I, but I was never really into fine art as a thing until my senior year of high school. I had an art teacher who kind of turned me on to Jasper Johns and Rauschenberg. Uh, who I'd never heard of before that, but, you know, I kind of appreciated their, um, their process and how out of the box they were compared to, you know, Renaissance or, or even Impressionism and that kind of a thing. So when I got to college, I applied, went to a school that had a drawing slash illustration major. And when I got to the art program in the fall, this is the fall of 93, I found out that they didn't have that as a major anymore. So I was like, okay, the next close to me, the next closest thing was painting. 
because uh, I didn't want to do photography. I wanted to be hands-on still. I didn't want to do art history for sure because I definitely needed to actually be making the work. So, uh, yeah, so I became a painting major and spent the next four years, you know, I, I can't even remember how many different figure drawing classes I took. So that was a good thing. And then I think I graduated June 15th or 14th and uh, July 1st, I was, you know, boots on the ground here in, in Manhattan, staying, sleeping on my cousin's kitchen floor because he had a tiny little studio apartment or one bedroom. Stayed with him for a month and was, you know, out there. Somehow managed to get meetings with Marvel and DC, which led nowhere. The guy I met with at Marvel even was like, you don't want to do this. You want to do something else. And I, I guess uh, maybe fortunately, unfortunately, listened to him. Um, got a couple of jobs waiting tables and ended up through some regulars at one of the restaurants I was working at. I got my first legit art job as an illust- working as an illustrator for an accessories company. Um, company was called offshoots. And so I was doing all kinds of like licensed stuff. Uh, but it was a lot of like hair bows for the Disney stores and, and that kind of a thing. It was, it was, but you know, I, I literally remember I was, the, I was sitting at my, I had a drawing table and then a computer. That was my, my setup at that office. And, uh, I remember like I almost kind of like broke down in tears when I got my first paycheck because I couldn't believe I was actually getting paid to sit around and draw like that seemed that was like a monumentally amazing thing that, you know, somehow that it all worked out. Um, but that was my first job. <laughs> Stay there for a year or so. I don't I, you know, kind of don't remember the exact timeline, but um, the dot com boom was starting to happen. This is the late 90s and there was a lot of freelance work and I. Uh, although the first day on the job, I had to ask my coworker how to turn on the computer. Uh, I, I realized that it was going to be important for me to, to learn how to use it. So I kind of did it for everything I could possibly, like I use it for everything. Um, and then transitioned to, I did some teaching with the Whitney and MoMA, uh, and then was doing freelance stuff, just, you know, whatever, whatever work I could, I could hustle up. And then was uh, working for a guy who did photo retouching and I had never done it before, but I thought I knew how to use Photoshop. And one of the first things he asked me when I interviewed is, you know, do you know how to use Photoshop? And I was like, yeah, I think I'm pretty good at it. He was like, no, you're not, (laughs) which was, which was, you know, it was, and then basically like one day into the job, I was like, oh man, like, yeah, I don't think I realized how little I knew like that, that program is deep. Uh, and it was great. You know, I was basically, you know, like a young grasshopper and he, he, we did, you know, wax on, wax off, paint on, paint the fence, you know, did the whole Miyagi. Um, like I, he started me off just mounting negatives on a drum scanner and then doing the scanning. And then he would show me how to like clean the bubbles and the dust out of the scans. And then, you know, each, you know, each little step built on the last one to where after working for him for two years, I was actually sitting with clients and, you know, had my kind of my guys that, that, that would trust me enough with their photos. How long were you retouching? So I did that all in all, I think it was about two years and then late 2001, maybe no. Yeah. Thereabouts. So I guess around nine 11 post nine 11, uh, I kind of had that like, you know, that thing where I realized that I, you know, I needed, I need to go back to grad school. You know, I, I had to give it a chance. I was like 25, I guess. And, or 26, 27, 27, 27. And wanted to, uh, wanted to try grad school and see like, all right, let's see if I can do this art thing. Um, so applied, got into UC Santa Barbara to their MFA program, and in summer of 2002, I hopped in a car with all my stuff and, and drove cross country to Santa Barbara. What, what made you want to go back to school? I think, I think because I, I was doing these other things and I was feeling good about it and I was, you know, I, I was good at what I was doing. Um, but there was that, that itch at the back of my head that was, that was saying like, wasn't quite done with it. You know, I was happy, happy doing what I was doing and I was making money. So that was good. But I felt like I was still doing other people's things and I wanted to try to do, I felt like I still had something to express 
So grad school seemed like the right thing to do. And the program that I applied for, the other part of it was uh, I do a little bit of writing and I've always been interested in philosophy and, you know, critical theory, art theory, that kind of stuff. So cultural theory. So I, the program I went to had a really strong component in, in that you had to take a, basically you took a theory class every semester, um, you know, each, you know, working like a 25, 30 page essay based, you know, one semester read everything that Nietzsche wrote, uh, did a semester on Deleuze and Guattari, um, and that was still painting your, your, um, yeah. So grad school, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a fine arts program. It's just, I think my, I think the technical degree I have is an MFA in art studio. Um, but I've definitely seen my classmates write, you know, whatever that, you know, their, their MFA was in, uh, site specific installation or, you know, haptic, whatever, you know, they, they, that it, it was, it was definitely full on choose your own adventure, uh, art school. So when I got there, I was doing these, these big paintings and they would be kind of landscapes and have these these dismembered uh anime looking dolls floating around in them that kind of a thing uh which all the the people out in california they all cut me up on that so i kind of reset you know did a few more and then kind of reset and that's that's really where i started getting back into drawing i started just doing all kinds of uh super duper detailed these kind of uh, mash, like lance, they ended up looking a lot like landscapes, but they were kind of mashed up of, um, you know, so have like a an aerial view of a roller coaster that would blend into, um, an act, you know, like a map of Kansas or something like that. And then, you know, so that the, they were, they were dense and complex and, and uh, very detailed, but all did, I did them all with a rapidograph on vellum film that like plastic kind of paper yeah yeah um so it had like a ridiculously clean smooth line this idea of layering right so doing that as a in a repertograph do you think that came maybe from your retouching the idea of just putting two things together that maybe wouldn't normally yeah that's that's a great observation i think i might have even written about that in my my grad thesis uh when i was you know defending the work or explaining the work or however you want to look at it um no i think it's a direct a direct correlation that that i was spending all that time before i got to grad school you know putting different heads on different bodies and fixing things um so the the idea that that reality was malleable i think kind of came out of that so you finished grad school. Finished grad school and came running back to the East Coast. I <laughs> Running? <laughs> basically. Well, I flew, but you know. Um, I, yeah, I, I had thought about staying out there, but I also had, I was in a long distance relationship um, and I wanted to give that a chance. Uh, and we've got two kids now, so I think it worked out for the best. Probably. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I came came back to the east coast i i kind of came back here and was doing some freelance retouching and then uh landed a gig at the museum of natural history as a exhibition designer so doing label decks and wayfinding and that was amazing that was that sounds awesome yeah it was it was i'd never done anything like that i had done obviously i'd done some design enough to get the job but i was definitely wouldn't have considered myself a designer, but it was great on the job learning. Um, my direct boss had just finished up her master's at Yale and right out of Yale got a job at Pentagram and then didn't, didn't like the culture there. So she got, she started working at the museum of natural history. So I learned, you know, it was, it was basically like a crash course, a, a year, on the job training in design, you know, all of the, the technical aspects of organizing space and type and, and all of that. Um, so that was kind of an amazing thing. Uh, but it also paid Jack. <laughs> it was ter- I mean, it's nonprofit and it, you know, it was, it was really cool. It was amazing to be able to go to that, to the, you know, to walk through the exhibits, to get to the, the office in, you know, which was, the design studio, the design department was basically like a little in this sort of castle like wing of the, of the building. 
and it was directly the design department was directly below the fabrication department. So, um, you know, from time to time you could go upstairs and just watch them building dinosaurs. And that was, that was also just super cool. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but like I said, it wasn't paying well. So from there I got a job at a big printing plant doing retouching, uh, but I didn't last there too long and I ended up at a tiny boutique, kind of like the, my first retouching job, a little retouching studio, um, called print to print who were downtown on, in Tribeca. And there I started, I was doing, you know, international Maybelline campaigns and, uh, it was a lot of hair. So, you know, Redken and, and, uh, John Frieda and all these, you know, big time advertising campaigns. Uh, and I was there for a little over a year, uh, but was feeling, you know, it's not that I had done so much retouching, but it was pretty high intensity. And the boss that I was working with was a little, uh, nice way to say it, artistic differences. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't really like the way he was running things. Uh, so I somehow lucked out and got a job at spin magazine from there. And, and, and at spin, I was in charge of all of their retouching from, from front cover to back cover. Uh, and that was definitely one of the coolest jobs because it was, you know, every, everybody that worked there had grown up reading the magazine and, you know, had beaten out every other really talented person who had grown up reading the magazine and all they wanted to do was work at Spin Magazine. So that was kind of, that was just kind of an awesome thing. I mean, I grew up reading Spin Magazine, so I was, I was very excited to, to be working there and, you know. How long did you stay at Spin? Spin was, I think it was three years. So this was around 2006. So in July 2009, I got laid off. Uh, but I had already been looking around for what the next stop was going to be. I had found this retouching forum, and it was, I can't even, it was like proretouch.com. I can't even remember what it was. Um, Retouch Pro. And it was mostly terrible. It was mostly, you know, from my point of view, it was mostly hobbyists. And uh, But there was one corner of this portal that where the pros hung out. Um, so when I was in, you know, in that it's sort of a chat room message board one time, somebody posted the, the headline of the post. I still remember was cause it sort of changed my life in a way was, uh, look at how ridiculous academia is. And then it was like, there's, you know, look at this job posting. It's, they want somebody who has five years of professional experience and an MFA. And, uh, you have to know how to do like this particular type of, you know, pre-press and and it basically was like tick 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 check 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 i knew everything uh you know all the boxes i could check except one but it was something that like wasn't even rel- it was you know some sort of very technical thing that nobody actually in industry used so i got my my cv together i i emailed a bunch of my students from santa barbara to, i was like do you guys have any of your work from when you were students uh and i didn't even get my student work together for the interview, I had to, I had the interview. And then, uh, I think that night I posted a bunch of links on, you know, like hidden links on my website and emailed it to the, the, the hiring committee. So I applied, but the funny thing was, is I sent my application in before I got laid off. So I think I applied in March or April of 2009 and then I got laid off in July and then I was scrambling and, you know, hustling and I spin hired me. They basically let laid me off and then were like, yeah, but don't, don't leave the neighborhood because we got to bring you back in here. And, you know, then they basically hired me back to do my own job, but at, you know, freelance rate with no insurance or anything like that. Um, so that happened. And then I was actually at the, the single worst interview of my entire career. Uh, I was at the daily news. I was in a fluorescent lit office working on a PC with no Wacom doing their, their test. Sounds amazing. Yeah, it was it was awesome. And I got the phone call from the secretary of the communication design department saying, you know, hi, is this Mr. Nugaborn? Can you come in for an interview next week? And I was basically like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> so I completely checked out of the interview. I don't I never even followed up with them. Uh, and they never followed up with me because I tanked. it. I basically gave up after that and and uh, came in for the interview and and 
the the secretary said that it was just going to, you know, she was like, yeah, if you want to, can you come in and meet with the department chair next week? So it sounded very informal, but I still, I, I had like two portfolios and I wore a suit and it was a good thing that I did because the interview was in the, the gallery here in the department and it was like a, you know, five people sitting behind a table and there was just a chair all by its lonesome out in the middle of the, the room. Uh, so, and it, it went really well, uh, obviously, I guess I got the job. Um, so that's, that's how I ended up teaching. And that basically gave me the freedom to finally get back to drawing. The problem was it had been so long and I was so out of practice that I kind of didn't know what to draw. Okay. So you went from retouching mm-hmm. to going back to school to get your MFA to getting your MFA, to retouching again, mm-hmm. then to heading the spin department of um, their, from like all their editorial to photos to- Just the, just the just, retouching. Yeah, the retouching department. Yeah. And then got laid off from spin. Yep. To freelance at spin. Yep. <laughs> and then get that call in the fluorescent room of the Daily News. Yep. <laughs> to get back to-, to, to, to get the teaching job yeah so then all of a sudden i was an assistant professor <laughs> right that's a it's so a I've, long... worked, I've worked a lot of different jobs yeah um so you mentioned obviously teaching gave you a lot more freedom i guess to go back to drawing mm-hmm. how because of the the schedule just because the you know working any of the retouching jobs and even working at spin you, know, you get in at 10, but then you're working until 8 or 9 at night every night. There's no I, – I didn't have the energy. I was doing some stuff, but nothing nothing consistent. So I wasn't – I didn't have the energy to, to pursue side projects, or I wasn't pursuing side projects. Nothing, nothing sustained. I was always doing some sort of creative thing, but not uh, not in a sustained way. There wasn't a – there were – you know, there was – there. it would take me so long to – to get any kind of momentum on something. Um, I think if I looked back at my sketchbooks or, you know, the, the flat files, I think there's probably more work there than I'd probably be surprised at how much work was there. Cause I've, I'm always, I'm always making stuff. I'm always doing stuff, but it, it's not like now, I mean, now the teaching it's, you know, if it's three days a week, that still leaves two full days. And even on the days that I'm here, it's just, it's a different type of attention. Um, you know, cause it's, Part of the job is that you do your research and the research can be anything you want it to be. And for me, I wanted it to be drawing. You know, it took me a while. You know, I don't know. It wasn't like this immediate thing. I got the job and then all of a sudden I was, I dove right back into it. Like I said, I kind of didn't know what to draw. And that's where the drawing the news thing came out. It was like, well, I don't know what to draw. So I'll, you know, I'll just pick something and then I don't, you know, pick something from the news and I don't have to, I don't have to, you know, waste all the time of, thinking about what to draw getting a teaching job Mm -hmm. gave you the time to start thinking about drawing again but you didn't actually (laughs) know what to draw right well i had so i had actually started a couple of years before i had floated the idea to my dad that i wanted to do i wanted to adapt a section of one of his novels into to make it into a graphic novel um but i had kept picking it up and then dropping it and you know I'd get a little bit done and then you know and then I drop it and never really got too much momentum on it um because life you know life life gets in the way of of a lot of things so the teaching job allowed me so I I it gave me it afforded me the time to to think about these things so I was so I started working on that more seriously um but the the big one of the big problems I was having with my own process and with my own skills, just sort of my, my, the level of skill. Like I said, when I was in grad, when I was in undergrad and grad school, I basically was spending, you know, 10 or 12 hours a day drawing and make, you know, drawing, painting, whatever, making stuff. Uh, and that basically went down to zero on that thing. I was still making stuff, but I was, you know, pushing pixels around on the computer, um, you know, or doing, doing layouts or whatever, but it wasn't, it was a very different thing than doing figure drawing. So I was, I felt very out of practice. Like I couldn't, I couldn't draw things the way I used to be able to. Um, so the drawing the news came out of, uh, a few things. One is, you know, to just sort of have like a warm up thing, but also 
I felt that I didn't have a style. You know, because I was out of practice, every drawing I would do was kind of an, its own thing, and it, it was a different thing and different stylistically. So I was trying to sort of establish, almost in a in a, not to say unconscious, but to try to through repetition, and and just doing something where I wasn't overthinking it, that I would get at my style that way. So drawing the news kind of became an exercise to kind of, I guess, formalize a type of style for you. Yeah. Yeah. And not even form, not formalize in terms of cementing it, but more to get to a point where I would be consistent in my mark making. So getting into like drawing lingo now, like I wanted to be, I wanted to have a consistent way of mark making of drawing. Why? Uh, so that that's a good question. (laughs) <laughs> so that my work would without necessarily having to to be you know to have everything be a series that the work itself would be recognizable so that somebody would see something and be like oh that looks like Eli drew that so what does the drawing the news illustrations look like drawing the news is black and white pencil on 9 by 12 bristol i use the same materials every for every single one it jumped around a little bit at the beginning uh when i first started it because i would just sort of draw on whatever was available and then it kind of pretty quickly became formalized as nine by twelve if i'm doing a portrait of someone i'll draw it portrait especially a uh if somebody's passed away an in memoriam one and then uh for most other scenes i'll draw them uh landscape I don't worry about filling everything. I try to just get the mo- you know, as much detail as I can get so that you can understand what's happening in the scene. That the combination of my my small, you know, less than a sentence caption plus what you're seeing will give you the gist of what the story is. Do you have an underdrawing or do you just go straight to paper? No, I go straight to paper. Is that was that hard or because of your education and and skill easy to go kind of right onto I think well I think that's one of the reasons why I chose pencil was because pencil is the underdrawing so the idea and also the idea that it's not necessarily a finished drawing I'm doing these in you know 15 minutes a half an hour maybe 45 minutes if I've given you know, if, if I don't have any any deadlines or or uh you know papers to grade but I th- I think as a result that's also that's kind of been part of the motivation of you know this trying to get it a style and and keep things energetic is that I'm not worried about making it look super finished um and as a result, I think it's allowed again it's allowed me to be kind of looser with looser with the style and looser with my hand and not not worrying about if everything's in the right place and not worrying about mistakes. Um, and, and uh, the interesting thing is that as a result, a lot of, a lot of the drawings now, uh, like my sketchbook drawings, I'll be able, I can draw, I'll go straight to pen on things with no pencil under drawing. Um, so it's really, uh, in terms of, it's really helped me in terms of composition in terms of, of, you know, it's rare that I'll run out of space for, for the feet or that kind of a thing. You know, it's, I kind of, I can gauge so I might do like, I might kind of make a couple of quick marks just to say, all right, well, here's where the head's going to go or, you know, here's the, the horizon line. And, um, but I posted a few process videos on, on social where you can see, you know, that it, the, the drawing just is like, I start in one spot and then it just kind of morphs out from there. And then, you know, as, you know, that as the drawing gets more finished or more complete, um, you know, the hand just kind of bounces around, like filling in details and stuff like that. Well, you definitely have a look and a style with this, this pencil. And I think it's, it, it's nicely curated the idea that my portraits will be in a portrait, la- you know, orientation versus other things can be in a landscape orientation. And if we, if we go look at your site, we'll definitely notice that they're all black and white, but do you ever decide, do you ever think you're going to add color to these? I think I've added color twice. And they, I think it was both when there were, um, I think one was when the Supreme Court legalized gay marriage. Uh, I think I I did a rainbow flag. Uh, 
I I have I think because I you know you, you the rules are arbitrary, but I, you got to be consistent with them. And I'm the one who made up the rules, so I could change them at any time. But in my head, this is this is what it is. And I've thought that different times, like okay, maybe I should maybe I'll do one one per week that I'll do like really like put in a couple of hours and add, you know, do watercolor. Um, but when I've added color, it, it just, it, it wouldn't fit with the other 999 drawings if, if all of a sudden they started being in color. Right. Right. No, I, I totally agree. And, and, and maybe don't want to see you start, you know, doing color ones, but it seems like the ones you have added color, there is a definite purpose for it. It's not just frivolous. It's not just, Oh, I'm gonna try this today. There's it, there, there's a message behind it, and I would call them somewhat minimalist, even though obviously, like you said, the mark making themselves because of how intense the hatching is, or depending on how you want to show depth and tone and and simplistic nature of a simple mark on a white background, it is kind of minimalist. Yeah, and to be consistent, which you mentioned earlier before as well, is that something that helps you? There's a lot in in the illustration world. There's a lot of emphasis put on having a distinctive style, and I didn't want I didn't want my distinctive style to be um, forced. I didn't want my particular style to be something that I chose in a way. Like I'm gonna you know I'm gonna start drawing anime eyes on everything, or I'm gonna make do the the chibi like giant head, tiny body like. I didn't want to have that kind of a style where it was very programmatic. That seemed like it would be a little disingenuine, you know, for my own way, uh, sort of art making, you know, influx philosophy that would have been disingenuine if I had done that. So what do you think your join the new style is or has evolved to become? It's, it's interesting looking back, you know, like I said, there's close to a thousand of them and looking back at the first ones, it's very, they're very inconsistent. There are some early ones that I think probably resemble the current ones, but I wanted it to be realistic. I wanted it to be not in terms of sort of hyper realism, but uh, maybe almost more like an impressionistic kind of a thing that, or just lifelike. You know, I wanted it. I wanted. I wanted to be able to you know sit across from somebody and and get their capture their likeness. And I wanted, but the style I think has developed to be, it's loose, but there, I think it's loose and energetic while at the same time, uh, being lifelike. If so, that, yeah. Right. So you said you have easily over a thousand illustrations. There's about, yeah, there's about a thousand now. That's a lot. <laughs> it um, is, yeah. So what is your your process of getting you ready to draw something from the news it's so i if if i have the time it's the first thing i do when i get to my studio so i'm kind of thinking of it as a, there's there's multiple motivations for it you know one of them was you know because i it, it's well what am i going to draw so i don't have to think about that another one is that it's a bit of a, it's a warm up i realized that at, at at that time when i started doing it i was completely out of touch i hadn't I wasn't really paying any attention to the news. I was, you know, doing, living my life, but I, I used to be very interested in current events and I wanted to, you know, get a sense of sort of the geopolitical landscape. Um, and it's sort of, it's interesting to me that it's coincided with some pretty interesting time. We live in interesting times, right? And things are getting more interesting by the day. So it's, it's possibly, uh, you know, I kind of was tapping into something there. I don't know. So just, you, yeah, no. So you said that it's one of the first things you do when you get to your studio, right? Right. So yeah. So it's there's a I wouldn't say it's ritualistic, but it's you know I sit down, I get out the sharp. I got one of those two point sharpeners uh, or two step sharpeners. Um, I use the same pencils, the Palomino Black Wings, which are awesome, and I use the same type of paper. I initially was using a, a vellum Bristol. Um, and now I just use a smooth Bristol. The vellum Bristol was a lot more forgiving because it kind of gave it gave the mark its own. It gave, it gave added texture to the mark. And now, now that I'm more confident with my drawing, uh, I don't need that. You know, so it's it's better to be working on the smooth because the smooth lets 
you know, kind of gets out of the way and lets the pencil do the work where I needed the help initially. Uh, it's very interesting. <laughs> yeah. It's a funny, you know, it's a funny thing. It's, it's, there was also, I had become really precious over the years working at spin and, and these different jobs, you know, compared to grad school where I was, things were precious. The, the work I made was precious because I was doing these sort of discrete compared to mass mar- mass produced stuff that I was doing for the, the jobs I worked at. I got to grad school and it's like, I'm going to spend a month on one drawing, you know, or something like that. And then like, that's it, that drawing, that's the only thing I could scan it or photograph it and reproduce it that way. But the draw, you know, the drawing or the painting or whatever was, was the thing. And so, uh, and then when I left grad school and I was working at jobs, I drew infrequently so that when I did draw something, if I was happy with it, it was like, I wanted to, you know, put it in a, in a, <laughs> a, a, what do you call like a, a totally safe enclosure and, and a hermetically sealed thing and, and, you know, put it on a pedestal. It's this perfect little thing. Yeah. Well, and it was, but it was, even if it wasn't, I just felt like it was, it was, there was something too precious about the work I was making. So drawing the news has gotten me to the point. And I think doing, doing the stuff, my, the requests I do for my kids, cause I'll draw something and be really happy with it. And then, you know, I'll give it to my kids and they'll pay, take out their markers and just completely F it up, you know, like, like just like, Oh man, I just drew Hulk perfect. And you, and, but I can't, can't, can't get mad at my kids for, for doing that. Cause that's the whole point. So that between that and the drawing the news, it's really gotten me to the, there's a, there's a level of confidence, but also a, a, a lack of preciousness that, you know, like it doesn't have to be perfect and it's not that it has to be just good enough. It's not that it's that I'm the sheer volume of work I'm making means that, you know, I don't have to worry about if something's good because I'm making enough stuff that I'm going to make enough good ones. So in the idea of, cause I think that's very interesting. The, the idea that it doesn't have to be good in your eyes to kind of just be something cause you're actually just continually making. Mm-hmm. So the idea that you're making, does that supersede the the idea of making quality work? I think it's not about it superseding. I think it's 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 more that I if I make something that I'm not happy with, I move on because I'm just gonna make another one. Where when I wasn't making a lot of stuff, if I made something that wasn't good, it was devastating because I was, you know, there was such a small sample size. But now, you know. I remember when I was, so here's, here's a, a, an anecdote, a process anecdote. When I was a kid, I had this idea for a cartoon and it, you know, like a typical New Yorker cartoon. It was a fencer lifting a hairpiece off of a guy and he was saying toupee and I was seven or whatever. <laughs> and my dad thought it was the best thing ever. And I, cause I did this little doodle and showed him and he was, you know, pat me on the back and wanted to hang it on the fridge and all that. And he was like, you should do like a finished version of that and maybe I was 10 even I don't know and he was well you should do a a really good version of that and we'll send it to the New Yorker and see if they print it and it was I couldn't draw it every single time I screwed it up the sketch that I did was the best thing and I think I think a lot of people that you know if you've gone to art school you you have that you you get that and that's that kind of gets back to that energetic thing that I'm trying to get in the drawings that a lot of people that if you've drawn, you know, there's that, that looseness and that energy and that lack of self-consciousness that you have when you're sketching that once you try to make the, the real one, you kind of, you can lose, you lose that energy and you lose the, the feeling in it. And there's that. a spontaneity in that. There's a spontaneity in, in maybe knowing that whatever you do is in the moment and it's okay at whatever level it's it's at because it probably allows you to one challenge yourself with different types of styles. Well, not different types. Well, challenges yourself with different types of scenes. Right, different subjects. Different subjects, yeah. and you know sometimes, like you said, with illustration, you're sometimes you're on, and sometimes you're off. Right. But what I heard in that story is is the pressure of your dad wanting you to send it to the New Yorker changed the whole entire thing. Right. I think that's interesting. I think that the 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 idea that that having the pressure of of making something what you perceive as more final 
change the whole spontaneity of, of just what was so good about the initial illustration anyway. Right. Yeah. It killed it. It totally. And I, I think, yeah, I, it's, you know, in design, it's like, if you, if you work, you just overwork something, you know, or, I mean, I, I think any, any creative discipline has, has this, it's, you know, like guys that can't shoot free throws or, or what was it with Knobloch when he had the, the, you know, he couldn't throw to first he couldn't base. Throw to first. Yeah. And he was out, he was out of the league two years, a year later or whatever. He, they moved him out to center field and then, you know, it was like a really, it's like a, a mental block. All of a sudden you're, you're thinking about it rather than doing it. And I think not to get super jazz about it, but there's, there's a certain thing that's, you know, kind of like with, with sports or with music or something like that. I think that you, you put in, you put in all the time, you put in all the hours so that when it's time to perform, you don't have to think about it as much and becomes this kind of, you know, you're still thinking about it. It's a conscious thing, but there's a level of all those hours are, are, are feeding into it. When did you realize that though? I don't know. I, I think I kind of always knew it, but I, it, I think this is the first time, no, not the first time, but this is, this is the longest sustained because I've had the, the teaching, it's been seven years and I've been doing this for consistently for five years, let's say, the drawing the news, maybe even a little bit more. And I think this is one of the first times where I've had this sustained effort of, you know, working on something on a regular basis and just, you know, just building this mountain of of material and I think just reflecting on the process itself has has helped me become aware of the fact that it's the you know it is the process that's I I think about it a lot when I'm teaching that you know because the the students especially the freshmen less so the juniors and seniors but you know when they first come out of of high school and you're they're in their first art class or, or whatever they the instinct is you draw you do one you know, you you do you have this one idea, this one sketch, and like this is it. But for me, the process is just putting in the work. You know that 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 I I put in the work and put in the hours and all those hours. It's not that each. It's not that any one of those hours has to result in something super specific or some kind of crowning achievement. But kind of it's all contributing to the same effort. So. You said probably five years mm-hmm. of this sustainable, consistent with, with outputting work and drawing the news, and now you have over a thousand pieces. What keeps that going? It's a mix of things. I think it's funny because there's there's people will ask me, well, so what's what are you going to do with it? And I honestly, I'm, I'm hoping there's going to be some sort of critical critical mass where it's, I'm you know, some, it's, you know, I'll get a book deal or I don't know, something nice like that would happen. I've had a couple of exhibits with it, but I think the thing that keeps me going with it is those original, those original motivations for it haven't gone away. The wanting to get better. You were talking about, you know, doing, drawing different scenes, drawing things that I'm not comfortable with. Uh, I'm still trying to push myself on that, you know, like more complicated architectural scenes or, you know, I can get likenesses now, but I could I could always be better. So there's that aspect of it that I, I feel like I've improved so much, but it's, you know, the, the more, you know, the more you realize you don't know. So the, the better I get, the more I realize I've still got so much more to learn. I could be so much better. Um, it's also because of social media, I post it everywhere. And so anytime I see somebody that I haven't seen in a month or, uh, you know, or more, there's, there's a lot of like, Oh, like I, I really, you know, I enjoy it. And it, there's kind of that motivation that I know, not that people are counting on me, but I know people like it and are getting something from it. But I kind of trick myself into, you know, into just sort of, sort of keeping going. Has social media, because you post these and get reactions to this, has this help sustain this project? Definitely. 100%. Yeah, the social media aspect of it is is big. There's uh, you know, face my Facebook is I have a per, like a business page, but because they changed all their algorithms, that's basically useless, you know, unless you unless you advertise, unless you're dumping money into it. Um, but th- there's it there's a pretty high level. It's interesting because 
Facebook for me is mostly friends and family and then a few former, you know, a few former students. Um, but even though I get the fewest likes, like Instagram, I get tons of likes on, on my drawings, but on Facebook, I don't necessarily, because most of the stuff I'm posting is negative because the, you know, the news sucks. Uh, and there's some people who are like, Oh, you should draw some happy stuff. And it's like, yeah, but that's the, the news. Isn't it about, there's the one human interest story where that dog, you know, found its way to California from Wisconsin to find his family or something, but it's generally, you know, bombs and death and mayhem. So, uh, so that's what it is. So I don't think, I think because of the way Facebook is psychologically, there's not a lot of likes, but ev- like, like I was saying, like literally every single person that I see, if I haven't seen them for a while, will mention that they, you know, they count on it, that it's something different in their feed. It, it's a relief to see it because it's not, you know, info wars or some nonsense like that. Bombs, death, and mayhem. <laughs> that, well, that can be the title of this podcast. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, uh, <laughs> bombs, death, and mayhem. The story of 2017 <laughs> illustrated by <laughs> enews. <laughs> Dot com. I think it was interesting that you said people do kind of look for that in their feed in, especially now in, in Facebook or, or, um, or Instagram, when you're looking through things, everything is uber colorful or kind of destruction or all this negative stuff to kind of have this serene white image, even though if the subject matter is not something that is as serene, but I think it's kind of interesting to see that in your feed because it does give us a break. I, you know, so I, I do think that's something interesting. And like you said, most people have kind of looked to that. Um, so yeah, I think maybe I'm, I'm, I would hope maybe there's something sort of meditative about it. Cause it's, you know, drawing is kind of a meditative act. So if, if that also translates through, yeah, I guess another formal thing you're saying about the signature, I don't actually, I don't sign most for the, for the WTF ones I've been signing them, but for, uh, most of them, all I do is I write, I'll write a little caption. So basically, you know, whatever the headline might be with the accompanying story. And then I put the day's date on them. Oh, okay. So everything is dated. So yeah, least, yeah. yeah. Another thing that's come out of the social media and the sort of the, the level of engagement is. Uh, a guy that I used to work with at Spin, uh, who now lives in Seattle, but we're connected on social media, and he's he's been a, a big supporter and fan. He he bought at least one of the drawings, um, but he's started a site since the inauguration. He started a site called WTF Just Happened Today, um, and it's very it's basically the kind of the same motivation that I had with drawing the new, or one of the motivations that I've had in keeping it up is that it's, it's a moment of pause in the, the sort of the, the never ending stream of, of information coming at information overload. It's like, okay, well, here's just, here's a simple drawing. Here's a black and white drawing of something that happened today. And for his, he's basically filtering and, and synthesizing, making a synopsis of the day's happenings. So what the fuck just happened today? What happened with with Trump and all of the you know in the world, um, but it's little little bits, and then a link to a primary source, a link to the Wall Street Journal or CNN or, or something, um, and it keeps it you know it's usually eight or twelve different points, um, but it's just black and white, and and he's got he gets like seven hundred fifty thousand uniques every month. And most of the feedback he gets, and he shared it with me when when uh, I did my first drawing with him. So much of the feedback is like they were like, "Okay, this is great, but keep it clean. People want it. You know, it's it's all signal and and no noise." And I think I think there's something to be said for that. In in given that there's so much, you know, that the signal to noise ratio is is just whack most days. You know, there's just so much so much noise, and you can't. It's hard to tell what the signal is so he's kind of filtering that out for folks and i think uh it was when he i had been following him since he launched it and he just literally just left his job uh put in his notice and tomorrow i think is his last day at his job and he's going to be focusing on this full time so when he was like hey you want to do something with me i was like yeah so it's almost this is this is kind of also you know what's it going to turn into or what's the end result with this going to be i think it's just going to going to change a little bit so now it's almost like i'm curating 
my drawing the news, not just picking any story, but now it's like super specific. It's just about basically the new administration and all of the corruption that's coming out of it. So are you splitting into two um, things, being your own personal draw the news, kind of what you see, or you're shifting into the what the F just happened for now, since I've, it's been a week and a half, um, and I think it'll be interesting to see what happens this summer when there's no classes. Um, last week, we were on spring break, so I I did one every day for him. I don't know, this week, we'll see if I get all five days. Uh, in the summer, I may do, you know, I know last summer there were some days where I'd do two drawing the news, so there could be the kind of continuing larger scope you know larger aperture um but then doing a specific one for wtf uh, but for now I, I think i'm i'm okay with it's you know and it's funny because like don rickles passed away over the weekend i was like oh man what a face i gotta draw don rickles and i was like i'm gonna do uh you know kushner or whoever whoever i drew in, instead because that was or the moab or something like that because that was what was actually that was what was happening um, but I'm still going to go back and draw Don Rickles at some point. <laughs> His jowls and, you know, <laughs> fat old people are like the most interesting to draw for sure. <laughs> Is there anything that you're most proud of? There's a few things I'm proud of. I'm proud of the fact that I've stuck with it and that it, it, the goal of getting better, I feel like has been accomplished. Um, and I, I'm very happy with the, the level of comfort and the confidence that I have in my drawing. And it's, you know, it's through my own hard work with this and, and sort of sticking with it. And that's really good. Um, it's also the, the, there is a lot of gratification with the, the feedback, the positive feedback that I get from people. That's, um, that's also really nice. Um, so yeah, I think those, those two things. Any struggles you see? with working on this project? One struggle that's sort of tangentially, or it's more more than tangentially related, but uh, is that it possibly falls in a dubious uh, dubious area, area of copyright because I'm basically looking at a news, you know, photo from Reuters or something like that and, and not completely copying it line for line, mark for mark, but, but not altering it either so uh the idea that I, if i did ever publish a book or if you know somebody wanted to publish a book of these <laughs> there would definitely have to be some lawyers getting involved so that's that's kind of if, if anything that's kind of been the big thing holding me back from doing a kickstarter or something like that because i i don't know i don't know i don't honestly you know i'm not richard prince and and you know i can't post i can't make giant prints of people's Instagrams and, and get away with it the way he can. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think with copyright, a lot of it is, it's all about enforcement, but all it would take is one photographer or, you know, or like I did the, uh, the drawing of there's that fearless girl, girl sculpture. And I did that drawing. I did the drawing of the fearless girl statue. And, uh, that's actually gotten such amazing feedback. Like people are so into that one. Uh, and I wonder, you know, the, the guy who made the bull sculpture has come out and, you know, he wants to like sue the people that are, that put the fearless skull sculpture because it's changing the meaning of his work. And that's sort of a whole other, that's a whole other, <laughs> a whole other topic. But like, what if that's the guy, you know, what if that guy sees that I did this drawing and want, decides to like send his lawyers after me? Um, all it would take is one. And then I'd be like, I, I don't know, I guess I'll stop doing this project and take it all down. Uh, so, so that's, I mean, it's not so much, uh, a process struggle, but it's sort of a, a larger philosophical challenge, I guess. Right. You mentioned something interesting. So sometimes life gets in the way, Mm -hmm. right? And you mentioned briefly throughout the conversation, um, you have two sons. I do. And you kind of do this little project with them and you have a hashtag. I think one is called tiny art director and tinier art director. Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, tiny art director is this is my six year old Zach and the tinier art director is his little brother, Leo, who's three, but he'll be four in a couple of weeks. So he's only, he's basically, I, I think of him as being four already. 
Um, yeah, so that's that's sort of uh, <laughs> my mantra lately has been uh, that my side hustle has a side hustle, uh, and that's that's kind of it's great because they love that I draw and they love to draw and they lo- like a lot of times before they go to bed, they'll be like, daddy, while we're sleeping, can you draw a zombie eating a shark or can you draw the Titanic sinking or, you know, whatever their, their current obsession is, you know, draw a cyborg and Robin or no, what was the tiny art director said, can you draw the Hulk and Captain America eating hamburgers together? <laughs> And he was, and then he like, he was like walking into his room and he stopped and turned around and he was like, make sure there's table and chairs. <laughs> this is the, the three-year-old. I was like, okay, of course, table and chairs. And I showed him in the morning and he was like, okay, good. That's the table and chairs there. Thank you, daddy. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, life, I got, there a lot of work, you know, and, and I've got, there's the teaching, there's the, the, the freelance stuff that I'm doing. And then there's all of this sort of art stuff and like I'm making comic books and, there's a lot. There's a lot going on. So, so you're, you're you're keeping busy. I'm keeping overly busy. It's it's kind of you know that that motivation that I had of making sure I you know I started this so that I wouldn't have to worry about what to draw. It's kind of like if I ever have downtime, there's you know a list of seventeen things that I need to draw, <laughs> whether it's for the tiny art directors or for one of the comics I'm working on or or what. It's a, uh, it's it's good. Like I'll sometimes I'll get stressed you know, because I'm, I've got these lists and things that I got to do. And then I'll realize like, no, this is all, this is all good because these are things that you've, I've created for myself. So do you, do you have a problem thinking about what to draw now? Nope. I definitely do not have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> not usually. <laughs> Cause your kids will definitely tell you to do something. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually, that's actually one really nice thing. I mean, I, I, I like it, if I'm not doing a drawing the news, like sometimes on on the weekends I'll, you know, I'll be like, Hey, what do you want me to draw? Just to, just to keep myself loose, keep me in, in practice, you know? And that's where I get the, you know, Captain America and the Hulk eating, <laughs> eating hamburgers. <laughs> it's great. Um, so you've been doing a lot of things. You've been keeping yourself very, very busy, but what advice would you tell yourself a younger self? That's a, you know, that's a funny one. I, I, I try to think of it, you know, this sort of the, the life journey as, as being, all a part of the process, you know, that it would have been, you know, because I'm getting back to making comics now and doing illustration, there's a part of me that's like, oh man, I should have gone to an illustration program instead of a painting program. But at the same time, you know, if I hadn't done the the fine art, I think influences, you know, all that, all that training, I think influences what I'm doing. If I hadn't worked as a retoucher, I wouldn't have all these digital skills, you know, so that I can make, I can work digitally as easily as I'm as I'm working physically, but I don't know. I think, you know, it's the kind of thing like I, I, I'm pretty happy in my life and I, you know, I I got, I got a great family and I, I think the idea of like going back and changing any of that, like if you change one thing, you know, it's the, the butterfly, like uh, when Homer Simpson goes back in time and squishes the mosquito, (laughs) stupid bug, you go squish now. And then like he travels back to the future and you know, everything (laughs) is completely messed up or everybody's, everybody's, you know, bug vampires or something like that. I think I kind of think of it that way. Like it's better. I keep my, keep my eyes forward. And, and I think, you know, I guess it's, I've, I've had a, been pretty lucky in life if that's, if I'm able to do that. Um, so I try to keep, keep focused forward and, and just keep thinking about what the next thing is, not what the last thing was. No, that's awesome. I guess, you know, if, if there was advice, if I could go back and tell myself something, I think it would be, you know, it's the kind of thing I would tell students is, is kind of that, that just, you got to put in the time, you got to do the work, you know, you got to just all the hours, you know, pay the idea of like paying your dues. That's basically what faking it till you make it is. It's, it's that's you paying your dues. You know, you, you say yes to everything and figure it out on the way and, and, and just, just work really hard if you want to be good. So one last thing, obviously the WTF what the hell just happened? Well, what the F just happened <laughs> um, it is been popping off recently. What other things do you see for the future of, of your illustrations? Well, the, the drawing the news, I'm just going to keep working on it. And the WTF thing is, is doing what it's doing. I've got a Patreon that it, I'm pretty sure I'm going to launch. <laughs> um, got everything, but the, I need to do the intro video. So I gotta, I gotta, uh, 
bug one of my video buddies to do that for me or help me with that, do some sweat equity. Uh, the, uh, the comics thing, I'm just going to keep doing the comics thing. I just f- self-published a second volume of Sharkery vs. Tsunami Crab, uh, which is this adventure story based on my boys and their, uh, their time at the beach. Um, got another comic called the long shadows and working on the second one. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it, I think because I've got the, the teaching as this, as a real solid anchor, I don't, I don't have to, I don't have to struggle as much in terms of like, or hustle as much, but I'm still hustling, but it's, I kind of have a, I have more freedom to, to explore. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind doing some book covers. I think that would be, that would be great. Uh, I've been sending my work to art directors. We'll see what, we'll see what happens with that. Yeah. I mean, it's just, just got to keep making stuff. Making is key. I think the fact that you keep up and you keep on doing it and you're motivated by the feedback and you're motivated by the responses you're getting from all the different things that you're putting out there is, is really, really cool. And just seeing the maturation of where this project has come from, from probably five years ago to noticing when I see a black and white post with that hatch style, I know exactly, like you said, because of the consistency. The consistency is key and it, it helps establish your voice. And I think that consistency is, is starting to show what Eli's voice is. And I think it's great that you're now linking with, you know, what the F just happened because it, it is a natural extension to your drawing the news. I thank you for today. Thank you. I, I, this is, it's very interesting. I, I, I'm interviewing a lot of friends and it's really, really good to kind of see what you guys are doing and kind of hear the process that you've gone through to get to where you are right now. Can't wait to see where else this goes. And thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, this is Works in Process. Thanks for listening. Go to the podcast website, wip.show, where you can find the show notes from this episode and find links to any artists, resources, and work that Eli mentions in this interview. Also, if you haven't done so, please subscribe to my Works and Process podcast on Apple Podcasts or any other place you get your podcasts. Wow, that's way too many podcasts. You also can connect with me on Twitter or Facebook via works underscore in process. That's works with an S underscore in process one word. And you can find behind the scene pics on Instagram by searching the hashtag works underscore in process. Thanks again. And until next time, follow your gut and trust in the process. Thank you.